This video is brought to you with the support of TrueFire. Learn, practice, and play with TrueFire. Hi, this is Keith Williams. Welcome to 5 Watt World. We're interested to help you get the most music from the least gear. From the father of rock and roll to the king of the blues, the ES-335 family of Gibson guitars were the instrument of choice. Introduced in 1958, the guitars Gibson called semi-solid arrived just in time to carry rock and roll and the blues to the top of the charts. Many, many guitarists have reached for a 335, 345, or 355 on occasion. But when it came down to it, I could only name 10 that I believe changed the world of music and the guitars we choose to play it on, with a few honorable mentions thrown in for good measure. I'll remind you that this is a list of those that I felt had the greatest impact. Not necessarily my favorites, though some of those are in here, and not necessarily those that had the greatest technical ability, though some of those are in here too, but those that changed the music in the greatest possible way. As the saying goes, your mileage may vary, and that's cool. I hope we can all enjoy each other's opinions and learn from what others love. If you enjoy this sort of countdown jaunt, then stay tuned, because this is the 5 Watt World short history of the top 10 335 players that changed the world. If you enjoy our videos, make sure to subscribe or grab a t-shirt, hoodie, hat, or a stomp preset pack to support what we do. And to become a bigger part of 5 Watt World, sign up with friends of 5 Watt on Patreon. There's a friend level to suit any budget. The links are in the description. Number 10, Chris Cornell. Often cited as one of the greatest rock singers of all time. He was also an influential guitarist and a stalwart user of semi hollow body guitars, and in particular, late 50s inspired, Bigsby equipped ES 335s. A core member of the original grunge scene with the band Soundgarden, playing Les Paul Customs, Cornell would move towards semi hollow guitars using Duesenberg Star Player guitars and Gibson 335s later. His use of both even overlapped with his signature 335s being originally released in 213, and a Duesenberg Alliance Series Black Hole Sun guitar was released at NAMM in 2016. But the guitars Cornell used the most during his later years were the Gibson Custom 50 Styles 335s from their reunion in 2010 on. In 2013, Gibson released a Chris Cornell Signature 335 that came in flat army green and flat black. As on Cornell's personal guitars, the Signature guitars had clear knobs along with brush nickel machine heads and hardware. Both models had Jason Lawler Lawlertron pickups, which are based on the original Gretsch Filtertron pickups. In the signature guitars, the olive drab model shipped with the Bigsby and the flat black guitar shipped with a stop tailpiece. Before the signature 335, he had used a red 335 with an unbound neck. That guitar has a set of Lawler Low Wind Imperials, a PAF style pickup with lower output to simulate aged PAFs. Cornell had openly talked about his struggles with depression, isolation, and suicidal thoughts in several interviews. Managing the depression across his career on and off drugs, he finally took his own life in May of 2017 while on tour with Soundgarden. Cornell's impact on the music world can be seen in the endless tribute performances of his songs that persist to this day. Number 9. Freddie King Though his early use of a P90 equipped 1954 gold top, as seen on the cover of Let's Hide Away and Dance Away, influenced Eric Clapton began seeking his own Les Paul, King switched to using semi-hollow Gibsons in the mid-60s when he bought his famous 1960 ES-345. As a boy, he had keyed in on the blues players, T-Bone Walker, Lightning Hopkins, John Lee Hooker, and Muddy Waters. Credited with taking the blues rock of T-Bone Walker and turning it into crossover hits, he had six singles on Billboard's r charts in 1961 alone. His playing influenced the guys in England as well, with Eric Clapton covering Hideaway on the legendary Beano album. King would use many different 345 and 355 guitars, all with the Veritone circuit that can be heard in his recording of the guitar tones. In 2019, the Gibson Custom Shop did a limited run of 200 guitars based on Freddie's 1960 ES-345. Number 8. Dave Grohl Heading one of the biggest rock bands of our time, Dave Grohl has been rocking out holding a pretty unusual variant of a 335. Grohl used many different guitars early in the band's history, but increasingly he relied on his Gibson Memphis era Trini Lopez reissue. You might not know who Trini Lopez was. Don't feel bad, neither did Dave Grohl when he bought the guitar in either 92 or 93 when he was still in Nirvana. He hadn't heard of Lopez, he just thought the guitar looked cool with the different inlays on the headstock. Lopez had had a hit song in 1963 with If I Had a Hammer, a protest song written by Pete Seeger and Lee Hayes back in 1949. 
But by the 60s, protest songs were much more mainstream, and Gibson offered Lopez his own signature model. Lopez asked them to change the F-holes to diamonds and to match the split diamond fret inlays that Gibson was using at the time. There were two models of the guitar, a deluxe version with two sharp points on the double cutaway, and the standard model. The standard was effectively a 335 with diamond holes and inlays and regular soft cutaways. The other startling feature of the standard model was the Firebird style headstock. Lopez never had another hit and the model was dropped in 1970. It's clear that Dave's signature model that came out in 2007 is based on that original red guitar. The 2007 signature at run had just 200 guitars in Pelham Blue and Ebony. Gibson did another run in 2014 with colors chosen by Dave, a metallic gold, and a pink champagne. Grohl has been quoted as saying, This is the sound of the Foo Fires. On every record, I might use different guitars now and then. For the most part, it's just this. Number 7. Carl Wilson Carl was one of the three Wilson brothers, along with Brian and Dennis, that founded the Beach Boys when they were still teenagers. He was the lead guitarist, and though he was the youngest brother, after Brian became less involved in touring, he became the de facto leader of the band from 1965 until his death in 1998. He said in interviews that he was deeply influenced by Chuck Berry and the instrumentals of the Ventures. In the band, he primarily functioned as lead guitarist and backing vocals, but he also sang lead vocals on some hits in the later 60s, including God Only Knows and Good Vibrations. Known for playing a number of Fender and Rickenbacker guitars, the guitar he was mostly seen using in the later days of the band was a blonde ES-335 with a factory Bigsby tremolo tailpiece that he bought in 1970. It's believed that the guitar was built in 1962. Wilson used it live for the band's early hits from that point forward. This is the image of Carl that most of us remember. If not for the 335, he was holding a 1967 Epiphone Riviera 12-string in tobacco bursts. Carl said he preferred the 335 for its rhythm tone and that he found it easier to play for leads than a Stratocaster. Number six, Alex Lifeson. As one of the members of Rush, Lifeson epitomized progressive rock guitar from the time the band burst onto the scene until the untimely death of their drummer, Neil Peart. This is the first player on our list that's best known for using the Cadillac of the ES300 series guitars, the 355. Initially offered as a mono guitar, the majority of 355s were wired as stereo starting in 59. The 355 carried many of the features of Les Paul Custom, the block fretboard, inlays, gold hardware, and split diamond headstock. Never as popular as Gibson had hoped, they stopped production in 1982. They went on to produce the model in artist signature runs like those for B.B. King and Lifeson. And in 2018, they began building them again in a number of finishes and configurations. Lifeson often described his white 355 as his main guitar. Lifeson bought the guitar in 1976, having custom ordered it from Gibson at the end of the Kalamazoo era. He said of the guitar, it's been my main guitar, and it is the iconic Alex Lifeson guitar. In May of 2022, along with many other iconic instruments from his career, Lifeson auctioned off the white 355. He said he wanted the instruments to be enjoyed by someone else, and that he and his wife were at a point in their lives where they just wanted to have less stuff. He said, I was sitting in our mudroom just off the garage while the removal truck was waiting. I sat there with the case between my legs, and maybe it sounds a little corny, but I was talking to it. I was reminiscing about the gigs we did together, he continued, and kissing the bubble wrap. The Wikipedia page for the Gibson ES-355 currently shows a picture of Alex Lifeson playing a white 355. Number five, Marty McFly. (laughs) <laughs> okay, I had to include this one, which is both sort of a spoof and one of the most impactful images of an ES-3 series guitars on record. In 1985, the highest grossing film was Back to the Future, and our main character, Marty McFly, has to step in to play guitar with the band. The setting is a 1955 Enchanted Under the Sea high school dance. The ballad goes so well that the band asks for a second tune, and McFly launches into a rousing version of Chuck Berry's Johnny Be Good. Famously, the movie shows McFly playing a Gibson ES-345, a guitar that would not be released until the spring of 1959. The 345 was developed alongside the 335 and 355 and 358, but didn't get shipped until the following spring. It was designed as an upscale version of the 335, sitting just under the 355. Like other guitars in the Gibson line, the model number was based on the guitar's price in the year it was released, $345 in the standard sunburst finish. And to clean up the citations, Johnny B. Good wouldn't be released until March 31, 1958. The actor, Michael J. Fox, who does play guitar, learned all the licks for the performance so that the director could cut to his hands with confidence, but the actual guitar performance was done by Tim May, 
and the vocal was done by Mark Campbell of the R&B band Jack Mack and the Heart Attack. When I made the video short history of the 335, the comments were full of folks saying that they wanted a red 345 because of Back to the Future. Or as some put it more simply, my favorite 335 player will always be Marty McFly. I reached out to True Fire to be my sponsor because I've used them for years. In honor of this topic, I've currently gone back to Larry Carlton's 335 Blues courses. With over 2 million users worldwide, whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced level player, True Fire has lessons to enhance and inspire your playing. Get 35% off courses using the promo code 5 watt 35 Or like I do, sign up for the All Access Pass to use the entire True Fire catalog. I really like True Fire, and I think if you give them a shot, you'll like them too. Sign up now to start your journey to being a better guitarist. I'd like to thank True Fire for their support in making this video. Okay, before we get into the real top five, let's do the honorable mentions. Though not as many players changed the world with a 335, there were many, many that used them at an important moment in their career. I don't think there's much question that the future of blues rock lies with Marcus King. He's known for playing his grandfather's 62 ES-345, a guitar that has since been copied for him by the Gibson Custom Shop. Eric Johnson has said that his quest for a red, block neck 64 ES-335 came from Clapton using one in his final days with Cream. Famously, Johnson recorded his Cliffs of Dover on a 335. Starting in a more rock vein later in his career, guitarist Gary Moore turned back to his first love, the blues. He recorded the seminal Still Got the Blues, and on that record and in concert afterwards, he used a mid-60s ES-335 with the original patent number pickups. Check out the tune, Have You Heard, to hear that 335 tone on record. In Blink-182, Tom DeLonge was known for his two guitars with one pickup each, a Stratocaster and a Gibson ES-333. The 333 was a stripped-down model with a satin finish and a silkscreen logo. DeLonge's custom 333 featured a single bridge position, dirty fingers pickup, and a single volume knob in a variety of fun colors in the mid-2000s. Okay, let's get into the top five. As I've said before, this is the order I settled on, but you'd likely have your own version of it, and that's cool. Number five, Noel Gallagher. Gallagher was the primary songwriter and lead guitarist for the band Oasis. Hugely influenced by the Beatles, Gallagher purchased an Epiphone Riviera that was made in Japan in the mid-80s. The original Rivieras were semi-hollow guitars built on the line next to the original 335s and were introduced in 1962. Originally, these were issued with mini humbuckers to differentiate and devalue them in the minds of potential Gibson buyers. Copies were later made with full-size humbuckers like those on this Japanese guitar owned by Gallagher. Except for the headstock shape and the name, they were structurally the same as 335s. In 1996, at the end of the Morning Glory tour, a dealer brought a red 355 to the rehearsals and Gallagher immediately fell in love with the small neck on the 1960 guitar. The guitar has a factory Bigsby, and Gallagher is in love with the slight wobble and sustain it makes possible, playing with all that feedback on stage. The Fred 355 is his main electric guitar on all the later Oasis records and everything he's done since. Number 4. Eric Clapton I don't think anyone used a guitar for less time with greater impact than Eric Clapton did with his 64 ES-335. There was confusion about Clapton and the 335 because he bought one as soon as he had some money in the Yardbirds. But that guitar is said to have either been simply put away or was destroyed. It's not clear. But the guitar he played at the final two shows of Cream's Farewell Tour at the Royal Albert Hall was purchased that afternoon at Selmer's Music in London. American guitarist Jerry Donahue was in London at the time and was working at Selmer's to make ends meet when Clapton came in and bought the guitar. Donahue had tickets for the show that night, and so he then got to see Clapton use the guitar that he had purchased just hours before, live, while making history. Based on the moment in time of Clapton using that red block neck 335, the 64 style ES-335 has been the best seller ever since. Clapton sold the Albert Hall 335 at auction in 2004 to benefit his Crossroads Rehabilitation Center for a cool $847,500. The guitar was purchased by the Guitar Center music store chain and later they worked with Gibson to produce replicas of the guitar for sale through their store. Number 3. Larry Carlton It certainly could be argued that the man called Mr. 335 might be at the top of this list. Like other prominent session players in LA in the 60s and 70s, Larry Carlton's background was in jazz, but he quickly realized that he needed something more flexible than a big jazz box to cover most studio dates. So in 1969, he went into a small store, and they had three 335s hanging on the wall, and he chose the one that he thought sounded the best. 
He swapped out the trapeze to a stop tailpiece and added a graphite nut later on. Many fret jobs later, he's still playing that same guitar. Carlton played his 335 on endless session dates, but he's certainly best known for his parts on the records by Steely Dan. And particularly the solo who played on Kid Charlemagne off of the Royal Scam is thought to be one of the greatest solos of all time. Top YouTubers keep circling back to remind us how hip and important Larry's playing was on this tune. This is one of the greatest solos of all time. It's, um, I can't think of a solo that actually has the harmonic and linear complexity in a pop tune, a tune that was a huge hit like this. This Larry Carlton solo is, is really one of a kind. Now, Kid Charlemagne was just one day, well, a few hours of one day in the life of a very busy studio musician. Sometimes a great moment like that can define somebody, but Larry is not defined by that moment. He's defined by his solo work, his solo career, all the records he's done as a solo artist and the decades of touring and concerts he has done. As Tim Pierce points out, Carlton went on to have his own solo career where he shows his own vision on the guitar, and this work has had as much impact on guitarists as his early work with Steely Dan. His solo tours and those he's done with Robin Ford are worth seeking out, both live and on recordings. But perhaps the best way to learn the depths of his playing are through the lessons he's recorded with Truefire, aptly gathered under the heading 335. Number 2. B.B. King Easily the most recognizable ES-355 on the planet is the signature guitar that Gibson created for one of the most influential blues guitarists of all time, B.B. King. Inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1987, he had the nickname the King of the Blues. King began his recording career in 1949, and these early sessions were produced by Sam Phillips, who would later go on to found Sun Records. That same year, while playing in a dance hall in Twist, Arkansas, a fire broke out when two men started a fight and knocked over the burn barrel that was being used to heat the hall. Once outside, King realized he'd left his guitar inside, and he ran back inside to retrieve it. The next day, he learned that the two men were fighting over a woman who worked at the hall named Lucille. King didn't know Lucille, but the circumstances led him to naming the guitar, and every guitar since, Lucille, as a reminder to himself as to never do something as stupid as run back into a burning building. King did, in fact, start playing those first records on a Fender Telecaster, but moved to Gibson soon afterward and is mainly known for playing an ES-355 TD SV. In 1980, Gibson launched the BB King Lucille model. The two big differences in the Lucille guitar are the script Lucille logo on the headstock and the lack of F-holes in the top, something that King requested to minimize feedback. From 80 to 85, Gibson built a BB King standard model with dot inlays on the fretboard and chrome hardware, and Gibson's subsidiary brand Epiphone have built low-cost import versions based on Lucille. But the majority of the guitars have been the full tuxedo-style, gold hardware, block inlay, stereo variatone equipped model. I've lost count of the number of musicians that I follow that have said that B.B. King's Live at the Regal record was their model for taste and tone. The Gibson Custom Shop even commemorated that recording by producing a short run of 100 guitars based on the 1959 Argentine Gray Burst custom order guitar that King used on that date. Go listen to the Live at the Rigo, learn the solos, and get some BB King in your playing like the legions of players have before you. Number 1. Chuck Berry Born in 1917, the aptly named father of rock and roll was about 40 years old when his career exploded with his hits Maybelline, Roll Over Beethoven, Rock and Roll Music, and, of course, Johnny B. Good. Though no longer a teenager himself, his lyrics focused on teen life, and his guitar playing featured solos and showmanship copied by rock players to this day. Famously, Barry played a P90 equipped 1955 Gibson ES350T early on. His use of the 350 sent many famous rock and blues players, such as Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page, to buy their own 350s in tribute to Barry. But when the ES-335 style guitar was introduced in 1958, Barry moved to the double cutaway thinline guitars for the rest of his career. He was most known for playing different versions of the 335, 345, and 355. One of the best known of these was a 1978 Faded Wine Red 355. In 2021, the Gibson Custom Shop made a run of 100 copies of that guitar. Barry was the first musician inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame when they opened in 1986. In that inductions, he was cited for not just having laid the groundwork of rock and roll sound, but also for a rock and roll stance. And John Lennon is famous for saying, if you were going to try to give rock and roll another name, you might call it Chuck Berry. 
And there you have it, my picks for the ES-335 style guitar players that changed the world of music. As I've said before, I think these lists are a good chance for us to practice agreeing to disagree gracefully. So please add the players that changed your musical world playing a 335, 345, or 355. As always, I look forward to learning from all of you in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, you probably would like my video, The ES-335, A Short History. First, I need to thank John Nathan Cordy, the shred legato playing monster of a little brother I never had, for composing and recording the 335 intro and outro music for this video. And yes, I know he's playing a Tokai copy. See his intro to the top Les Paul players for more of this type of cross-brand satisfaction. I want to thank everyone that stopped by the store and picked up a hoodie, a hat, a t-shirt, or a Stomp preset pack. And in particular, I need to thank my friends of 5 Watt on Patreon. It's the guitar community I've always wanted. You're all 5 Watt world. I just make the videos. Thanks for hanging with me until the end. Until next time, I'm Keith Williams. Thanks for being a part of the 5 Watt world.